Hi there. I'm standing in the Great Hall amid a dazzling display of artwork by Robert Windsor Chandler, like leopard and deer behind me, alas, all by myself. April 9th would have been the opening of our exhibition, The Electrifying Art and Spaces of Robert Windsor Chandler, and we would have celebrated together in this room. Like everything else in the world today, that opening is being postponed, so I am here to take you on a virtual experience of the exhibition, so we maximize our time with these extraordinary artworks that are on loan to us from collectors from all across the country. Before doing that, how about a little bit of an overview of planning fields for those who don't know much about us yet? Located in Oyster Bay, Long Island, Planting Fields is the home of W.R. and May Co. The estate is characteristic of the era of the American Gilded Age, when the country's millionaire society was building country estates like this one. Through the generosity of the Co. family, the site is now owned by the state of New York and welcomes over 200,000 visitors annually. Planting Fields Foundation and New York State have worked together for nearly 70 years as stewards of this exceptional space. Set on 409 acres featuring a landscape mostly designed by the Olmsted brothers, Co Hall, where the exhibition is located, was a family home designed by architects Walker and Gillette in 1918. Famed architecture and landscape photographer Maddie Edwards Hewitt photographed the site in the 1920s, and here you see some of the shots she captured, which give a sense of what planting fields looked like in its prime. The Coes looked to historical English aesthetics for the architecture and design of their estate, at the same time that they looked to the past for inspiration, they were also forward thinkers inviting some of the leading artists and tastemakers of early 20th century America to help convey the eclecticism we see in the house today. So Chandler was a fun personality and certainly who I would propose when asked if you could meet someone from the past. The late New York Times writer Christopher Gray once aptly wrote about Chandler that he lived big, he loved big, he painted big, and he was just plain old big. A native New York son, Chandler was born in 1872 and was raised in the Hudson Valley. He and his nine siblings were the famed Astor orphans, whose parents died within two years of each other, leaving the children a massive inheritance. He was most active at his East 19th Street home and studio, dubbed the House of Fantasy, and spent the later years of his life in Woodstock, New York. Highly sought after by New York's elite set, who regarded his work as a status symbol, Chandler's two immersive mural commissions at Planning Fields, which we'll go see shortly, are illustrative of the Gilded Age patronage that served as a catalyst for much of his work. Now I'm upstairs in Mayco's bedroom, also known as a lace room. This room prompts lots of oohs and ahs with its shimmering metallic effect. The original mural was commissioned by May Co, but was later removed and said to have been destroyed in a fire. What you see today is a faithful recreation from 2010 that was based on two existing colorized photos of the space. I love how Chandler used the lace to serve as two-dimensional architecture in the space. This feminine room contrasts with the masculine vision of the American West we encounter with the Buffalo mural. The Buffalo mural is the main reason why we are here celebrating Chandler today. This year marks the centennial of the making of this space, which may not sound like a big feat, but in the preservation world it is. The artist's unorthodox material choices and complex architectural creations have resulted in inherent vice, causing difficulty in preserving his creations. Even W.R. Co. wrote Chandler Studio a few years after the mural was completed, expressing concern over flaking paint. Though Chandler painted some of the finest interiors, including the loggia of the Park Avenue Colony Club, the swimming pool grotto ceiling at Vizcaya in Miami, both of Gertrude Vanderbilt Whitney's New York Studios, located in Old Westbury and New York City, and a number of other spaces, the majority of which have been demolished. Only the Buffalo Mural and Vizcaya Swimming Pool Grotto are accessible to the public. This is an opportunity for planning fields to serve as a catalyst in the resurgence of awareness and celebration of the artist. Here you can actually visit and stand right before one of his works in the exact context for which it was made. What we are looking at here is a buffalo hunt, actually bison, set amidst the Wyoming landscape, a place that was near and dear to the Coe family. You can see how Chandler built up the mural with plaster, giving the two-dimensional piece a sculptural quality. 
He also used metallic powders to add a certain exuberance to the space, imparting an appropriate Gilded Age effect. Our partners at New York State's Bureau of Historic Sites Conservation Division have worked for decades to painstakingly maintain the space, allowing it to be presented with such integrity. The Buffalo Mural and the Lace Room are integral to planting fields and won't be going anywhere. So as soon as the dust settles, please come and visit us so you can get up close to these artworks. Now we're back in the Great Hall, ready to start our tour of the electrifying art and spaces of Robert Winthrop Chandler. Chandler was prolific and highly visible in early 20th century America, yet after his death in 1930, he fell into obscurity, and that is why this exhibition is so important. It's the first time since 1926 that a collection of his art is put together for the public to enjoy, at least virtually in this case. The Chandler retrospective in 1926 at the Grand Central Galleries featured nearly 60 works of art, including screens, panels, and portraits. The current exhibition, in addition to the two murals of planting fields, includes a total of 12 works of art, among which are seven folding screens, a decorative art form that became synonymous with Chandler's output. It was while the artist was studying in Paris in the 1890s that his fascination with the mobile art form was born. According to Ivan Narodny, author of a 1921 Chandler monograph, he had found at last his Pays de Rêve, the richly lacquered surface, awakening countless aesthetic atavisms and suggesting fascinating possibilities for future development. Unlike many of Chandler's screens that have both sides painted, often presenting two opposing scenes or narratives, the two sides of porcupines and foxes are suggestive of a continuing narrative and reflect a consistent aesthetic treatment. Chandler returned to the subject matter of porcupines throughout his career. Another work depicting the creatures, Porcupines and Nightmare, was donated to the Metropolitan Museum of Art in 1927 by Chandler's sister, Elizabeth Winthrop Chandler, who married writer John J. Chapman. The Chapmans were the owners of Before the Wind, also on view in this exhibition, and also featured in the 1926 retrospective. Chandler's Baroque-like interest in capturing a heightened sense of a moment is evident in Fighting Zebras, which presents the creatures in a ferocious combat. This screen was featured in a 1929 House and Gardens article alongside zebra pattern textiles and earthenware sculptures, the graphic black and white patterns being distinctly modern. Equally dramatic, Tiger Screen is characteristic of Chandler's favorite technique, which involved richly built up layers of gesso finished with complex glazes of paint and metallic leaf. It's a prime example of Chandler's ability to create two vastly distinct works of art that share a substrate. The dominant side features five golden tigers running with claws extended. Chandler's most recognized work, Leopard and Deer, also known as Death of the White Heart, was painted during the years of the artist's contested divorce from opera singer and famed beauty, Lina Cavalieri. After a long pursuit, Chandler finally married Cavalieri, signing a prenuptial agreement that relinquished much of his property and fortune to her. Chandler's brother, Archie, 
who had been forcibly committed to Bloomingdale Hospital in 1897 for mental instability, famously cabled Chandler, who's loony now, upon learning of the arrangement. The tumultuous marriage dissolved quickly, and Chandler personified Cavalieri and himself as leopard and deer. Peacocks, birds of paradise, and flamingos were reoccurring subject matter. As Narodny noted, not satisfied with what ordinarily meets the eye, he reaches towards the far magic of the sky, bringing strange beasts and fabulous birds at his beck and call. These gorgeous avian marvels fly to the surface of his creative consciousness and assume their appointed places in a given composition. In Birds of Paradise, painted in 1913, Chandler used long brush strokes to capture the flowing plumage of the perching birds of paradise and the cascade in the left of the composition. While the birds are normally known for their exquisitely colored feathers, Chandler rendered them in monochromatic shades of red and ochre. He returned to the subject matter in 1928 in a screen also titled Birds of Paradise. This screen merges the exuberance and luminosity of Chandler's use of metallic surfaces with the cascading plumage of the five birds of paradise perched on the tree. In correspondence referencing this work, he stated, paradise shimmers, it's silver, not gold. The extravagant beauty of the peacock has made the creature the protagonist in many forms of art. For Chandler, the peacock was inspirational and was a subject matter of a complete interior produced in the early 1900s on view at his East 19th Street address through the mid-1920s. Chandler returned to depicting peacocks a number of times throughout his career, in all instances featuring the creatures in the forefront with a bold red background accentuating their colors. Thanks so much for watching, and I hope you enjoyed it. We can't wait to show you these pieces in person soon. Until then, please do your part and social distance, stay safe and stay home. Can't wait to see you on the other side of this. Bye.